But if you start out simple with HTML, CSS, static websites, you don't, you don't try to pick everything up all at once. That's impossible. Yeah. Um, you'll be, you will be incredibly overwhelmed. But I think people underestimate how many powerful tools are out there. Things like Airtable and Zapier and Stripe and all of mm-hmm. these things that did not exist 10 years ago. And yeah. you can piece these tools together in an automated way, um, especially with Zapier, to fulfill and do a lot of this stuff without needing any true development experience. Now, it's not trivial yeah. to learn these products, um, but it's easier than it is to learn to code, deploy, manage, handle a whole software development process and all of that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And so you start with these solutions, right? And you learn. Focus on the business, not the code, right? You don't have to code to build a business. I mean, for years and years and years, businesses existed without any software at all. And plenty of mm-hmm. businesses still exist today. All right, we are recording. Today I have on Garrett Diamond. He is a longtime software engineer and designer. He's the creator of Sif, Sifter, excuse me, where he's a solo SaaS founder, created a tool for bug tracking and sold that company. And he's now a marketer at Wildbit, which I believe you guys create those are developer tools, all of your yeah, products yeah, at Wildbit, yeah, correct? It's really all developer tools. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you, Garrett, for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Yeah, thanks for having me. Definitely. Um, so I'm excited to interview you. We talked about this a little beforehand, just because you have such a huge breadth of experience in software engineering, design, creating products. Um, but I'd like to start off and just ask you about, you know, what are you working on right now that you're most excited about? And why is that? Um, at the moment, uh, you know, the day job is wild a bit and, uh, it's been a great place to work coming from being self-employed and being a terrible boss for myself, um, <laughs> to joining a team where just, it's a much more healthy culture. Um, mm-hmm. everybody's really supportive. We do four day work weeks, um, 32 hours and, uh, really just the team's great. Um, is it's, it's hard to overstate just how great this team is. Um, where we try to be really deliberate about focused work and Mm -hmm. just supporting each other, being respectful of each other's time, not wasting everybody's time with meetings um, or interruptions and and that kind of thing. So it's just a really, really great environment there. And it's been huge um, to make that change. Um, And so there I do a little bit of everything, uh, mainly focused on marketing, but I kind of end up dabbling in a lot of different things. Um, for us, marketing isn't your traditional, let's just spend a bunch of money on advertising or that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we've definitely done some conference sponsorship and that kind of stuff. But more than anything, especially with me in this role, we try to focus more on what do developers need, what information, what tools, and just try to build things that are, that are helpful to people. Um, so we've got some free tools and some open source stuff and some other stuff like guides that we've written and we just really try to think about what are free resources we can create that'll help people. And then hopefully if we help them enough and they need a product like ours, they'll remember us when it's time. So less, how can we spend money on marketing and more? How can we help people and cross our fingers that it comes back around? Nice. So it sounds like, are you guys doing a lot of content marketing, like educating um, yeah, I mean, I, I try not to think about it as purely content marketing because then I feel like mm-hmm. that becomes the goal in and of the, yeah. the work. Generally, um, for us, what a lot of it comes down to is we'll talk to the customer success team or the sales team. And depending on what questions they're getting a lot or they have a hard time explaining just because it's a really technical concept that you can't communicate over the phone, um, we'll just sit down and say, okay, great. We can write up a resource, work up some diagrams and Um, generally just create things that help them do their job and then it works out. So it's, it's less the pure content marketing side. Like how can we optimize this content and do this and more just how can we understand what people are struggling with, try to help them solve that pain and then put it out there and people will find it. And from talking to a lot of the email industry experts on things like delivery and that, um, it seems like it's working because we constantly hear like, yeah, postmark's the first place we go to refer people when they have questions about DMARC or um, some of these other really complicated topics. And so <clears throat> really that's just been what we've been trying to do is figure out where people are struggling and try to make that easier, more approachable, more accessible. Nice. It seems like solving problems for people would be a more mainstream way to market your company, but it's, you know, apparently it's not. A, 
It's the logical way. Um, mm. You don't get the quick returns, right? You're not going to yeah. get that dopamine hit of like, oh, look, I got 10,000 visitors today. Yeah. Um, we've definitely been playing a long game. I've been with Postmark or with Wildbit really, um, but focused on Postmark for about three years. And I mean, we've been growing steadily uh, since then. And we've really kind of started picking up speed more and more um, in the industry. We're kind of, we're, we're bootstrapped. We're not funded. We don't have any external mm-hmm. investors pushing for crazy growth numbers or anything like that. So we're not interested in growth hacking and all that. So, well, most of our, the alternatives in the industry are just trying to grow, grow, grow at all costs, give really crummy customer support, that sort of thing. We've just focused on, we're not in a hurry. Let's just take care of our customers, try to do the right thing. Even if it means we don't grow as fast as some of the other companies, we're okay with that. Um, and it's, it's working. Yeah, it sounds like it. When you when you talked about talking to the sales team, are you then going and packaging the informational solutions to the problems the sales team is bringing up, or in some cases, are you guys actually developing low cost products you just give out for free? Um, most of the we've only got a couple free products, um, and those have just been more industry related things that we know the space needs. Um, mm-hmm. Generally speaking, with um, talking to sales and uh, customer success. It's more um, usually technical topics uh, that people are struggling to wrap their heads around. Like a lot of our customers are mm-hmm. sending email on behalf of their customers, for instance. Yep. Um, and so in order to do that, you need, they need to have their customers authenticate with all the various email standards so that the delivery is as good as it can be um, and take advantage of some other things. And, so I wrote a guide to do that, which they then turned into a webinar so they could teach people and then they record. And so we kind of just do that and figure out like, what's the hot topic? What do people keep asking you about or what do they struggle with? And we just create something useful. So sometimes, usually it's a guide. Um, sometimes it's a video. Sometimes it's um, just a, a quick blog post even. Um, and then that way they have something to use. A lot of times, they, you know, they get the common questions. How do you compare to this provider, that provider? So we created comparison pages. Um, things like that that help potential customers or existing customers kind of understand where we fit into the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that seems pretty awesome to have that sales team coming up with some of the questions too, because sitting there trying to think of the next, next content piece to pump out is definitely a lot less useful. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't have to be the sales team, right? For a smaller company. I mean, for me, it was the same thing at Sifter. Um, I was the one answering emails. I was the one writing code. Um, I was the one writing all the content. And so it was just a constant juggling act of what are people asking about? What are people struggling with? I need to write about that. Um, It helps me. It helps them. um, Reduces support requests. Saves them time. Saves me time. Everybody wins. Um, And so it's just something you kind of have to be, um, you have to kind of just tune in for, right? When you're talking to customers and potential customers and really listen for those things that are patterns and recognize that stuff and then just turn it into content. And it's slow and methodical and publishing something simple. Generally, you're not, you know, you're just not going to get that. Wow. That was a huge thing. Everybody loved it. Um, You know, if it does its job, you're just going to get fewer emails and you're never going to notice. So it's hard to get excited about that and stay motivated about that. But over the arc of time, when you're talking years, that kind of stuff begins to pay off significantly, just not in an exciting way. So it's hard to stay excited about doing that kind of work. It's it's tedious, it's boring, uh, but it works out. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, And you mentioned when you're starting Sifter, you didn't have customers then. So this was feedback you were getting from teams you were working with, correct? Yeah, never direct feedback. Um, Was doing consulting. The first decade of my career more or less was consulting. Um, And so I was exposed to a lot of different teams, different sizes, different types of products, different delivery processes, different QA processes. Um, And so I saw the best and worst of everything. And uh, later in my career, I kind of trended towards smaller teams and smaller projects. And one Mm -hmm. of the things that I noticed was one of the things that gets cut out uh, usually in those cases was quality assurance. Um, and not quality assurance in the super formalized, heavy duty, higher QA team, but just there was just nobody double checking things. Um, mm. You know, like 
nobody would, well, not nobody, no, no professional magazine would publish an article without an editor to review it. And it yeah. should be the same thing with software. Um, but we come in and a lot of teams that are existing processes, uh, the problem would just be write code and ship it. And a lot of times <laughs> things would break and it just, it wasn't healthy. Um, and so I noticed that, you know, from talking to teams, just the regular QA process, they wouldn't adopt it. They weren't big enough. Um, they didn't have that experience. They had never seen the true benefits of it. And it was really hard to get people to adopt it because most of the QA related tools were just really overwhelming. Um, and they're great for huge teams. If you're a huge team, you almost have to have a big complicated product, but for smaller teams of like five people and less, it was just so overwhelming. They'd be like, Oh, we know we should try this. They would try it and they would fail because it was way too much for what they needed. And yeah. I, you know, just kept seeing this pattern over and over again and decided, okay, what if I intentionally built a deliberately underpowered bug tracker that just kept it really, really simple so that there wasn't any heavy configuration or overhead and uh, just put it out there. I initially really didn't even have plans to build it. I just was blogging ideas and designing for fun. Mm -hmm. um, and in sharing that stuff without any big plans, people started emailing me and saying that they were excited about it. They wanted to know what I was going to do if I was going to create a product. And at first my answer was no, no, I'm just kind of playing around. Maybe I'll open source something. I don't know. Um, and over time I just kept hearing from more and more and more and more people. And so finally I said, okay, I guess I should try to make a product out of this. And uh, that's what I did. And it kind of, it was yeah. one of those things where I knew there was a little bit of pain, um, started doing some work to explore it. And before I knew it, there was enough justification to try and take it somewhere. Try to make something out of it. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this before the call. You, you brought this up as an important point. Um, you'd spent almost a decade working as a consultant. So not only did you have all this experience from working with tons of different teams, but you probably, I mean, you can answer this. Would you have even been able to identify that, need for those teams had you not had all that experience? I mean, it seems like it came directly from that. Yeah. I mean, it's a combination of things. Um, mm. So on one hand, one of the best things about consulting is the diversity of experience and teams and exposure you get. Um, so even if you're not building a developer tool, you're going to mm. see the pros and cons of different approaches to development, uh, different languages, different team structures, different priorities as the team give design more importance than development or development more importance than design. And you're able to make more informed decisions and have more informed opinions about what works and what doesn't work and why. And then that helps you, generally speaking, make better decisions long term. Um, the downside of consulting is you don't get to follow anything through, right? They bring you in, you do it, they kick you out and they mm -hmm. take it and run with it. And so a lot of times um, teams that don't necessarily have the discipline, don't stick with the things you try to help them with and things just don't hold up over time. And so a lot of it comes down to how do you help teams adopt processes that they can manage that aren't too big for them that are, you know, it's, it's kind of this right size thing, right? For a small team, a lightweight process is good. For a big team, a lightweight process isn't enough. For a small team, a big process is suffocating. And so, it's kind of getting to the point where you can find that happy medium. So that's been one of the great things about consulting. Um, the other thing is just the diversity of technologies you're exposed to and the understanding on that side too. And you start to see certain technologies have certain pros and cons and different weights almost in terms of the burden they put on the team to manage them, QA them, test them. And so all of that information over the course of a long period of time definitely sets you up um, just to, to be more informed and educated about everything. And then you can start making, uh, it wasn't until Sifter that I really settled into specifically Rails and um, the technologies around Sifter that I ended up using and just focusing in on those. And so that was really nice once I did get into Sifter, but then at the same time, I started to worry that I was stagnating by no longer having that diversity of exposure to .NET or Python and Django and every other technology that was going on because I was just yeah. using the stack that I was using. Um, and mm -hmm. so that kind of can be a, a concern as well. And it just takes some, some active effort to stay on top of it. Yeah. And so you're now back with a team. 
and you're saying there's all these benefits to consulting. What made you want to go back with the team? And what made you want to start doing, doing marketing after all this? Um, <clears throat> I mean, with Sifter, really, whether I admitted it or not, half of my time was spent on marketing. Um, okay. And as a designer, developer, product person, everybody wants to believe that marketing is just for crappy products. Mm. Um, but you can have the greatest product in the world if you never tell somebody about it. Uh, it's never going to go anywhere. You have to tell somebody. Um, and marketing doesn't have to be sleazy, right? There's sleazy marketing and then there's genuine marketing. Um, unfortunately, most people are looking for the quick wins that, you know, get their quick hit and it's, they take the sleazy route. Um, either obvious spam or subtle spam. Um, and they, they go that route because it feels like that's the only thing there is. Uh, but so much of marketing doesn't have to be that. It can be, you know, go create something that helps people, create something for free that genuinely helps people, but ultimately is just a lead generator for your product. Um, you know, uh, in our case, one of those is DMARC. We have a, a tool for DMARC, which is an email standard. It generates reports and emails them to you um, about your email. And mm -hmm. it's free. We, we give it away. Um, it's a significant cost for us to support, maintain, and run. Um, but it helps generate awareness for Postmark. And <clears throat> there's, you know, that you can do tools, you can do content. There's a bunch of different ways to do it. It's still marketing. You're telling people about it. You're increasing awareness, but you're doing it with them at the center of your efforts instead of you at the center of your efforts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a longer game to play because you're not just, you know, yelling at people to use your product. But uh, for us, it's worked really well. And, um, you know, with patience and, and concern about customers, it, it, it kind of, it starts to pay off, you know, over time. Yeah. That's interesting that you say, you mentioned that it takes all the maintaining you have to build that because, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of cases where if you can attribute the customers, just engineering something useful is going to cost you less in the long run than, you know, I mean, cause content creation takes man hours. Ad spend of course is not free. So I, I'm, I'm it just seems like there's, that's an underutilized, uh, I guess, <laughs> Avenue for attracting customers. The core of it, the, the big difference is there's marketing that puts your customers and potential customers first, and there's marketing that puts you first. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they hear marketing, think commercials and things that interrupt to scream something at them. Um, not something that just kind of slips in and says, Hey, I'm here if you need me. Um, you know, if you don't, I'm going to stay out of your way. And like I said, it's just a less immediately rewarding and gratifying way of doing things. Um, but by putting customers at the center of everything we're trying to do with our marketing, um, it makes it a lot easier. It makes it a lot more enjoyable, right? I mean, no, I, mean, I don't want to say nobody, but it's not fun to just scream at people and say, hey, come use this, come use this. Come use this. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot more fun to say, hey, here's something that we hope is helpful you know, if it's not helpful, it's free. So. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's, that's interesting. The whole psychology behind that. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing too, as the tools, especially for more expensive tools, like enterprise level software and things, that's, that's gotta be the way to, to, to do it because, uh, you know, some of those higher ticket products where yelling at people is just completely ineffective. Well, and, and you can kind of see this. Um, I think my favorite example is you look at Samsung's advertising, and their mm -hmm. advertising is very, very heavily focused on themselves, mm -hmm. right? And you look at like Apple's advertising and Apple's mm -hmm. advertising for the most part um, is more focused on the creators, right? Mm -hmm. the, the designers, the writers, the developers um, and the capabilities, right? The empowerment. And mm -hmm. so it's two very different philosophies, right? I mean, both those companies stray in either direction. Um, but if you look at it holistically and you step back and, look all the way at it. Samsung's all about talking about themselves and Apple's all about putting the emphasis on the creators or the creations, not the products that do that. Like some of the Apple commercials, you'll see the product and there'll be hardly any product mention through the whole thing. Um, and I think that's just a big difference is who's at the center of the marketing. 
Yeah, that's, that's two really good frameworks. Uh, you know, how it's the messaging and then just how it's visualized, use at the center. I like that. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, one thing I wanted to get back into was at the start, you said something kind of interesting. I, I don't know how, how much you were kidding, but uh, you said you need to go back because, you know, you're a horrible boss for yourself. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what you meant and, like, if, if that was completely sarcastic or, so, or how that works out? No, it's, it's, it's definitely fairly genuine. Um, for me, part mm -hmm. of it was um, age and responsibility related. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, 10 years ago, I didn't have kids and all that stuff. And he's just in a different place. Um, so for me, working was my hobby and that was okay. Um, but over the course of 10 years, start having kids and other priorities. And I was doing really, really poorly at extricating myself from the day-to-day -day work. And mm -hmm. um, part of that was a belief that at some random totally arbitrary threshold, I would be able to change that behavior. Um, yeah. Once Sifter hits X dollars in revenue, I can hire people. Um, mm -hmm. Once it has, you know, this need or whatever it is. Um, and so I kept telling myself it was always right over the horizon that we'd be able to hire help and, and do some of that. And, and I never followed through with it. Um, and I just was bad about giving myself leeway to relax and so it was hard to, t to, to see it at first once I joined wild bit um, Chris and Natalie the founders um, our husband and wife they have kids too um, mm -hmm. are very deliberate about um, our values at the company um, there yeah. are a few th like one of those is just there are a few things that are urgent right like slow down relax go home work on it tomorrow, figure it out tomorrow. Um, and very understanding that things like a lot of our best, your best work, no matter who you are, it's not going to happen at your desk. It's going to happen when, you know, and it's, everybody's done this, right? You're working on something, you can't figure it out. You go to bed, you wake up the next morning. And as soon as your eyes open, the thought just pops into your head and your problem is solved. Yep. And too often we think we can brute force our way through things when so much of our healthy, deep work, our really high quality work happens when we're rested, right? And so they really do a good job of driving that home. Um, when you're one person, you kind of feel the, the weight of everything. And you're like, I've got to yep. do this. I've got to handle that. I've got to handle that. And it's really hard. Um, and you don't necessarily have enough revenue to easily delegate and hire people and keep them around consistently enough that they're familiar with the systems and they can learn and roll with it. Um, but at WildBit, it helped me see like, wow, I was really wrong about so many of the things I was doing, um, you know, working too hard, working on vacation and going through the process of due diligence and selling Sifter. I also saw a lot of opportunities for automation. Mm. And so I'd see things, I'm like, man, I wasted a lot of time doing that. Where if I'd spent a day automating that process, you know, by writing a little bit of code, it would have saved me so many emails. And I was so heads down, I just didn't notice those things. Mm -hmm. until I stepped back, went through due diligence and they're pouring over every detail of how you do your business. And they're like, Ooh, yeah, that's kind of clunky. I shouldn't be doing that. Like <laughs> when you have to explain it to somebody else. You realize just how messy it is. Um, and so now I'm a lot more deliberate about looking for and recognizing opportunities to make things better and simpler, automate whatever it is. And, free myself up so that I'm not on call or, you know, what, what have you. Um, I think doing Sifter now, if I started over again today, uh, besides all the technology advancements, I think probably the biggest improvement that would make the biggest difference is the wisdom to know what is important, what isn't important and what needs to be automated mm -hmm. and reduce the stress and burden I put on myself as a result of that knowledge or lack of knowledge beforehand. And now I'd be like, Oh, this isn't that big of a deal. You know, <laughs> wait till tomorrow. Yeah. The, the not rushing yourself is really difficult. Um, do you have any, any practices or any advice you think people could use, you know, that you've gained over the years from going from always you know, rushing yourself to. Um, unfortunately, I don't think <laughs> it's something that you can just hear from somebody and believe it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of have to be almost on the verge of discovering it for yourself. But really, I mean, the biggest thing is that a lot of the things, especially as a solo founder or a founder with a very small team and limited resources, you tend to, there's just a lot. And if everything is important, then nothing is. And so you kind of have to really start to think what's really important. And then if it's important, do it. Um, there's a book. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Cal. The book is called uh, Deep Work. And yeah. it's about how, you know, we can really only get about four true hours of productivity every day. And email and social media and slack and all this stuff it just slices and dices our days into pieces and we're not productive and so a lot of it comes down to get rid of things that are urgent and focus on things that are important so for me mm -hmm. a lot of times and everybody's different but like i like to get up first hour clear off all that urgent stuff um and just accept the fact, you know, kind of drink my coffee. It's just casual. I'm getting into the pace of the day, finish all that stuff, get it off my plate. So I'm not blocking anybody else. Um, in my case, that's usually what it is. I don't want to block other people. So I want to handle all that and then yeah. shut everything off and just sit down and work. So whether these days for me, most of the time that's writing. Um, but really a lot of it's just acknowledging that you have to carve out time. However that is some people scheduled on their calendar and say, here's four hours of uninterrupted time that I'm going to shut off email. I'm going to shut off Slack. I'm going to shut off my phone. I'm just going to work. Um, just being deliberate about it really is the best advice I can give because with all of these things, all these interruptions, it's too easy to let it have at you and you end up having no time. You're, you know, that feeling at the end of the day, you're like, I didn't get anything done today, but you feel like you were going nonstop all day. But then mm -hmm. it's the end of the day and you're like, what do I have to show for today? A bunch of emails yeah. I replied to. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's all about being deliberate about that and really setting yourself up for that time and committing to it and following through with it. it. You know, it's a lot like working out, right? Like it's not purely fun in and of itself. It's hard to make mm -hmm. time for. Um, but if you do it consistently over the long term, you look back and be like, wow, I'm really making progress. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. It, uh, it is pretty wild how little you can get done feeling busy. Yeah. I think every, everyone's definitely experienced that. So one thing, again, I want to circle back around to was, you know, before the call when you said, I had asked uh, Garrett about starting a company. And he said, you know, the thing you want to be careful about is giving people the idea that you can go learn to code and start up a company despite all these things online. So you, you mentioned that you had 10 solid years of consulting. If someone's newer and they're interested in, in the long run getting into entrepreneurship or building a product, is there anything you'd recommend, you know, working for an entrepreneur, working for a solid team of developers? So, I mean, a lot of it is finding a job or a role where you're exposed to something you're excited about um, mm -hmm. or finding those jobs or roles that help you uncover what it is you're excited about. Um, so for some people that may be design, for some it may be development, some hybrid of the two, um, for some it may be content or accessibility or project management or product management. Um, I mean, if you, if you want to start a company as a one or small, you know, one or two founders, um, you know, one of you needs to know development and it's important to get that development experience. Obviously, uh, to me, consulting is one of the best ways to start a career because of the diversity and the things you're exposed to. You can figure out what it is that gets you excited and what it is that just bums you out. And mm -hmm. based on that experience, um, you know, it, you, you can start to hopefully steer your career in a direction that's more exciting to you. Um, consulting though, at the same time can be kind of difficult and frustrating. One of my old bosses 
framed it as effectively mental prostitution, right? Like <laughs> you're just renting out your brain is all you're yeah. doing. Um, mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, it's hard to be invested in the work, be excited about the work. Um, but for the most part, that's natural, right? Like you're getting the exposure, you're learning, um, you're seeing a variety of teams and that even when you don't realize it, you know, you, you, you work with one team and you don't notice you're learning something and then you go work with another team and you notice they're not doing something that you took for granted mm -hmm. um, with the previous team. And you're like, oh, wow, that's really important <laughs> to make sure you make time for that and do that. Um, yeah. And so it helps you see that. Um, so not only the career slash role options kind of you see get exposed to, but also the technology, you understand what technology you like, what technology you don't like. Um, for me, I spent a lot of time with uh, ASP.NET and I realized I hated it and that they didn't care about web standards. Um, mm -hmm. It may have changed since then. Um, so I switched to a Mac and Ruby and never looked back. And I love writing Ruby. You know, it has its own quirks and challenges, but as far as languages go, I love writing Rails, writing Ruby, working with those tools. I hate mm -hmm working with .NET. I hated C-sharp. I just, I didn't enjoy that, right? Um, and that's the thing, everybody's different. There's plenty of people that love C-sharp and .NET mm -hmm. and uh, feel really productive with that. I just didn't. Um, but I never would have known that had I not kind of been exposed to so many different tools and options and languages and teams. And so that really helped um, on that front. Um, my little brother's just getting out of college. That's what I told him. I was like, go into consulting. Spend five years nice. in consulting to yeah. form your own opinions and to learn and then decide what you want to do. Um, so that's, a, that's my take on consulting. As far as founding a company, again, design and development um, are two of the most obvious skills that everybody focuses on. Um, marketing is another one. Um, I think one of the best ways to learn marketing is to build something that needs to be marketed. Um, that could mm -hmm. be a book. It could be a podcast. It could be, it could be anything, but learn how to market whatever it is you're creating. Um, learn how to communicate with people about it, to effectively um, communicate concisely, meaningfully, compellingly. Um, again, the marketing's about them, right? Most people get into marketing and they just talk about themselves or their product, um, but that's not useful. What you wanna talk about is, what's your target audience? What's their pain? What are they dealing with, right? Um, and, and focus on that. And so learn some design and development, but force yourself to do some marketing by launching some kind of small product. Um, so you start to learn and really appreciate not just how do I sell this? How do I advertise this? How do I write ads? Um, because that's the least important part. It's how do I write good copy? How do I communicate effectively? That's mm -hmm. where the marketing really starts to matter. And if you don't, learn that or get familiar with that at some level. It could be an open source project. Write some open source yeah. code and market it um, because that stuff needs to be marketed too. It's not marketing because it's not a paid product maybe, but it's still communicating, mm -hmm. generating awareness. And those skills come in incredibly handy. Um, yeah. Some of the, the most successful like app developers um, that I've talked to, they started with an open source reputation. They just built something or started contributing to a project um, and built a reputation in the developer community for doing good work, helping, um, and then parlayed that into a product they could create. And so you're getting some experience. Um, of course, it's not easy for everybody to just go do open source work at night, right? Especially if you're older, you have kids, you have obligations. Um, that's easier said than done. Uh, but still, there's a lot of opportunity, um, you know, if you're doing consulting. Maybe you can't do open source, but you can go focus on a language or get more familiar with the technology that you can then later use. Um, but trying to find a way to get into marketing and just touch all aspects of a project and get that context. Because even if you aren't necessarily the marketing person on your team, having a little bit of understanding of marketing is going to help get a product off the ground and that sort of thing. I feel like of all the people I talk to who have projects that never went anywhere, they built it. They launched it. They have no idea how to market it. That's yeah. where everybody falls down. Anybody can learn to code and design, which sounds crazy to say. That but, does. Right? There's a million 
code schools and yeah. tutorials and all that stuff on coding and all that stuff subjectively mm-hmm. can be say it's finished. It works. But marketing, mm-hmm. nobody goes and watches, not nobody, few developers and designers are compelled by marketing. So they never learn about it. They take it for granted and think mm-hmm. that it just happens automatically. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you build it, they will come. And I feel like that's where most people go wrong because they never get exposed to that. Never try to really understand that whole side of things because so much marketing is sleazy. It's hard not to view marketing as a sleazy practice as a whole. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's so true. There's so much bad marketing, especially when people think that all marketing is the same as, you know, low ticket item direct response marketing, which is like night and day. People picture like a late night infomercial or something. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you've sold this company now, you're back as an employee. A lot of people would look at that and, I know you mentioned the schedule helps you out, but they would think, you know, why would you go back to being an employee? Are are there any plans for you to start another company or pretty Um, happy where you're at right now? I'm definitely really happy where I'm at. Um, I don't Mm -hmm. think I could say that at many other places, if any. Um, I think originally I thought, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to get the itch. I'm not going to be able to handle it. I'm going to have to start something again. Um, Right now, I don't, I mean, I, I, wrote a book and did that on the side. Um, That's done. And now uh, my wife and I are actually in the process of starting a nonprofit site to help amputees become more active. Um, A lot of the reason I sold my company was because I lost my, well, it was, I sold the company before I amputated, but uh, it was on the horizon. Um, All the health issues, the downtime, it's just, I needed to go somewhere where the burden wasn't entirely on me. Um, it's mm-hmm. the best decision I could have made at the time. Um, joining Wildbit really helped. And yeah, I mean, part of me has that entrepreneurial itch. Um, but being at Wildbit has been such an overall improvement um, for my life. And now that uh, my wife and I can go kind of do this nonprofit on the side and still scratch that itch in that way um, without having to worry about whether it's going to pay our bills or anything like that. It's just, we can go do something we care about. We're excited about. Um, I can still use all the skills I've learned to build software um, and do that. And hopefully that'll fulfill me on that front for a long time to come. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like you're in, really enjoying the role a while bit. So that's, it's, that's it's a special company. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I, Sifter integrated with one of the Wildbit products and used one of the others, Postmark, um, for mm-hmm. years. So I had known yep. the team. I had interacted with the team. Um, Postmark was literally my favorite product to write a check and well, credit card every month um, because it helped me so much. It made an aspect of running Sifter so much easier. Um, so it was kind of cool. I was like, you know, they were the first and only people I reached out to. I said, hey, I think I'm selling Sifter. Um, what do you all think? They're like, yeah, join us like okay and uh did it and um you know really haven't looked back at all no regrets no i mean every now and then i kind of wonder how it could have played out differently um but that's more of just an exercise in curiosity rather than any kind of deep regret yeah yeah it does it sounds that sounds like the perfect way to exit a company um so I just have a couple more questions here. You still good on time? Yeah. 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 So uh, one of the questions was, you know, you mentioned marketing and you did say something that was pretty interesting uh, for me. You said, you know, just go learn some software engineering and some development. No big deal. So (laughs) for all the people who are on the opposite end of the spectrum, they're marketers you know, and they're thinking there's so much, so many resources out there that say it's not worth it to learn to code. Don't learn. It sounds like you have a different opinion on that. Um, so I have a a layered opinion. Um, one, there's a lot of incredible tools out there that enable you to do some pretty awesome stuff, uh, Mm -hmm. without coding at all. Um, one of the, um, people that I would strongly recommend following is Derek Sivers who he started CD baby and um, 
he has a lot of wisdom in how he did it. Uh, one of the things he talks about is how literally every part of the process for him was manual. When CD Baby launched, um, you know, he goes into the details. Basically, it was an email system. People would yeah. email. He'd reply to the email. And then he'd go over to a spreadsheet and update something. And then he'd go over to a fulfillment <laughs> thing. And so none of this was automated. There was yeah. very little code beyond a static HTML website that he updated manually. And you can do all this stuff manually. People have done it. Yeah. Um, and then, and the great thing about this is your costs are low. And you're going to learn where that pain is real quick. Mm -hmm. And if something becomes painful, then you go in and fix it, right? So mm -hmm. maybe you add WordPress or some CMS in for making it easier to manage the content on your site, right? And so mm -hmm. WordPress isn't trivial to learn, but if you start out simple with HTML, CSS, static websites, you don't, you don't try to pick everything up all at once. That's impossible. Yeah. Um, you'll be, you will be incredibly overwhelmed. But I think people underestimate how many powerful tools are out there. Things like Airtable and Zapier and Stripe and all of mm -hmm. these things that did not exist 10 years ago. And yeah. you can piece these tools together in an automated way, um, especially with Zapier, to fulfill and do a lot of this stuff without needing any true development experience. Now, it's not trivial yeah. to learn these products, um, but it's easier than it is to learn to code, deploy, manage, handle a whole software development process and all of that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so you start with these solutions, right? And you learn, focus on the business, not the code, right? You don't have to code to build a business. I mean, for years and years and years, businesses existed without any software at all. And plenty of mm -hmm. businesses still exist today um, without any software or with very minimal software. So you start simple, you learn that, you learn the business then you can start expanding it by adding things like WordPress or maybe even getting into custom development, learning Rails, um, but start with the absolute simplest thing and learn that. And then slowly expand the components and the pieces as you need over time. Nice. I like that. I feel like people can do just about anything with that advice. I mean, uh, it's... It, yeah. I think if you, know, if, if you look at it, you say, I have to be a Rails developer, a system admin, um, a database administrator, a front-end <laughs> developer, an accessibility yeah. expert, a marketing expert. Yeah, that's going to be yeah. overwhelming and scare anybody yeah. away. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't have to do any of that. Like, you know, start out self-publishing a book. Just going through that process, you're going to learn a lot. Um, you know, start a blog trying to teach people information. Like one of the best ways to learn is to try and teach somebody else. Right. Mm -hmm. So every time I think I understand a concept and I sit down to write about it, I realize just how little I understand and how much more I have to learn in order to communicate effectively about that. But by the time I'm done writing the article, I know it really, really well. And so there's different, I mean, again, everybody's different, right? So everybody has different mm -hmm. amounts of free time, um, access to different tools, what have you, but there's always something you can do, right? There's an angle that everybody can fit into their own time, their own schedule, their existing role, um, and you know, th I think the biggest thing to all that is it's not going to happen in a year, right? It's certainly not going to happen yeah. in a week or a month. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's probably going to take two, three, maybe five years to really get to a point where you're comfortable. And a lot mm -hmm. of that requires finding the right role where you can do the work you want to do. Um, and it's, it's having a deliberate approach to say, I'm here. I want to be there. How do I bridge this chasm? In knowledge. Is it purely job based instead of watching TV at night? Can I watch some screencasts to learn a yeah. new skill? Um, you know, do I need to read more developer books instead of, you know, whatever other kind of books? Um, there's ways to just chip in. I think too often people just see, like, well, that person's incredible. Like, yeah, they've been doing this for 20 years. Like, yeah, you know, they weren't incredible. Nobody was incredible when they started. Everybody was terrible, mm -hmm. really, really bad, um, mm -hmm. myself included. And it's a, it has to be a willingness to say, it's going to take me 10 years to get there. And that's yeah. okay. Um, so, you know, it's patience. It's patience and deliberate practice. And it, it'll happen. Um, but yeah, a lot of that just takes directed attention in the right areas to get there. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty mind blowing. Actually. I, most of my professional career I'd done, uh, small group leadership for companies. And when I tried to do software engineering, it seemed like it was impossible until I had a few projects I was working on where I was like, well, I'm just going to sit in this chair for three days straight during the day. Mm -hmm. And then magically I would figure it out. (laughs) I never, I never had that experience that, Oh, I, I just literally have to just sit here and do absolutely nothing else. Yeah. And a lot of it too, I think is people, if you look at a regular web project, even just the core Mm -hmm. stuff, rails, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Ruby, that's five things. Each Mm -hmm. of those things you could virtually dedicate your career to. Yeah. Um, And people do. Yet some people think they're going to pick up all five of those things in a six month code school course. Now you're going to get exposed to them and you're going to have some context, but you can't expect yourself to learn those in six months unless you're a very special edge case, right? It takes (laughs) time and practice. And even if you learn them until you use them in a real project, um, you're, you're not really, really going to know them forwards and backwards. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, it just boils down to start simple, start with HTML, learn HTML, add on CSS, add on JavaScript, and your front end is down. And depending on how much JavaScript you learn, maybe you can use Node or something like that on the back end and take advantage of your JavaScript knowledge. Um, Even then, you're going to need two or three years of production time spending working on production, deploying to production with JavaScript before you're going to be really, really comfortable shipping a paying product. Mm. Uh, And it just takes time. But if you ease into it one step at a time uh, and have more reasonable expectations for that learning curve, uh, it's, it's totally doable and it's a lot less overwhelming. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome advice. Well, And Garrett, the last question I have for you is, is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't, that you'd like to tell people about? That's a big question. It's a big one. Um, I mean, I I think that I wouldn't say it's necessarily a question, um, but to get started with anything, I feel like one of the most overlooked skills with, anything is learning to produce, create, ship, and market, right? So not like so many developers hack on things on the weekend, right? And you kind of play with some scripts or you write a little bit of code. You're like, oh, that's neat. It's on your computer. Mm -hmm. Um, But the gap between writing something that works on your computer and shipping it and collecting money, like, it's huge. It's just ginormous. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and collecting money, even to get, taking payment from people, providing support to people, um, marketing that those things that aren't the core of the development process, but are core of any successful business. Mm-hmm. You can practice those skills by writing a book, by <clears throat> making videos and screencasts and selling those. Um, and there's some incredible tools out there that make that stuff easy learning to sell, take money and give support are some of the most overlooked skills and that side of running a business that you don't Mm -hmm. need to ship a software app to learn that stuff, but you do need to put yourself in a position to learn that stuff uh, because then those same skills are going to apply to being able to build something, a bigger, more ambitious project. And so find time to learn those things and don't neglect them. Don't think, Oh, That's easy. I'll figure that out. If I can code, I can do that stuff because it's not about something being difficult or not. They're both difficult. It's about having that mindset and that understanding, asking for money to pay for something. A lot of people struggle with that. Shipping something and making it live, flipping that switch and saying, here world, have at it. That scares the pants off of people sometimes. It still scares Mm -hmm. me launching things now. Um, It takes deliberate practice to get over all of that fear and to learn those skills. And I feel like that's an area that most people overlook because they never make it that far. So you almost have to push yourself to get that far and try to learn that stuff and get familiar with it, get comfortable with it 
because otherwise, no matter how great anything you create is, if you can't bridge that gap, it's going to be dead in the water. Awesome. That's awesome advice. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and cut the recording, but Garrett, cool. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank yeah, you for sure making thing. time to you know come and give people some advice. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.